At Midway, all three U.S. aircraft carriers, USS Enterprise, USS Hornet, and USS Yorktown, launched torpedo bomber squadrons from their carrier decks and sent them against the Japanese carrier task force. 100 torpedo crewmen flew into battle on the morning of June 4, 1942. They belonged to one of three squadrons, Torpedo Squadron 8 from USS Hornet, Torpedo Squadron 6 from Enterprise, and Torpedo Squadron 3 from Yorktown. The torpedo crewmen operated the Douglas TBD Devastator, a 5,600-pound, 35-foot-long monoplane, occupied by a pilot and a radioman gunner. During battle, torpedo planes were supposed to spread out. Wafting 100 feet above the water and at close distance, they dropped a 2,000-pound torpedo at an enemy ship. Unfortunately, prior to the American entry into World War II, the Navy had experienced limited progress in the arena of torpedo gunnery. The only American aerial torpedo known as the Mark 13 performed poorly. Inside the American carriers, the air group staff devised only one solution to fix these dysfunctional torpedoes. They recommended that torpedo pilots fly as low as possible so as not to disrupt the delicate systems as the torpedoes dropped into the water. Each pilot had to fly at 100 knots and release his torpedo only 500 yards from the target. This advice made torpedo attacks especially dangerous. At 100 knots, an American torpedo plane would be an easy target for Japanese fighters, and if they charged within 500 yards of an enemy ship, Japanese anti-aircraft gunners stood a good chance of shooting them down. To reduce potential losses, the American admirals recommended that torpedo bombers never attack alone. They should always go in with fighter protection and in concert with dive bomber squadrons attacking from above. A combined, coordinated assault would scatter Japanese defenses and give the torpedo bombers a chance to execute a safe drop. But at Midway, the torpedo squadrons went in alone. When USS Enterprise launched its Torpedo Squadron 6 at 8 a.m., the torpedo pilots missed their chance to rendezvous with the other squadrons. The other squadrons launched first, and by the time Torpedo 6 got off the deck, the other planes were nowhere to be seen. As soon as they got airborne, Enterprise's fighter planes and dive bombers pulled up to their standard cruising altitude of 20,000 feet and disappeared. The pilots of Torpedo 6 couldn't even use their radios because the task force admirals demanded radio silence for all combat missions. No one from USS Enterprise's command staff gave the torpedo pilots instruction for how to rendezvous with the other planes. Like it or not, Torpedo 6 was on its own. For over an hour, the squadron commander, Lieutenant Commander Eugene Lindsay, navigated his 14 planes across the wide, empty Pacific Ocean. When the squadron reached the position where the admirals had expected to find the Japanese carrier fleet, the pilots found nothing. Quickly, Lindsay guessed that the Japanese fleet must have changed direction. Signaling to his pilots with hand gestures, Lindsay turned his squadron to the north. In about 30 minutes on this new heading, Torpedo 6 caught sight of the Japanese fleet, a mammoth battle group consisting of four carriers, two battleships, three cruisers, 10 destroyers, and 5 oilers. Additionally, 45 Japanese fighter planes prowled the skies above the fleet. Lieutenant Commander Lindsay swiveled his head, looking for the other American squadrons. He saw nothing. For 10 minutes, he circled cautiously, awaiting the arrival of the other planes. But soon, he became concerned about his fuel supply. His pilots needed every drop to execute their attacks and return to the fleet. Eventually, at 9.40, with no sign of reinforcements, he decided to attack. With no fighter cover, everyone in Torpedo 6 knew that the attack would be a slaughter. Yet none of the American pilots wavered. Ensign Irvin McPherson was a pilot in Lindsay's squadron. Behind the controls of his TBD, he remembered how he felt when he heard his commander's order to attack. There wasn't a thought of shirking, for we each had to live with ourselves afterwards and we each knew that every other fellow in the squadron would go in. Maybe in the back of our minds, too, was a memory of the scenes of Pearl Harbor and a flying over Jap-held Wake Island. Individually, we couldn't let the rest of the squadron down. I suppose that is what morale means. Anyway, it worked somewhat like that with me. And so we went down, 
We came in from the north northwest alone. No fighter support, no dive bombers. We all picked the same carrier, intending to get it regardless of the danger. The Torpedo 6 pilots barreled toward Kaga, a 38,000-ton Japanese carrier that served as part of the Pearl Harbor raid six months earlier. Lieutenant Commander Lindsay radioed for a squadron to split up. Half his group received orders to hit Kaga from the starboard bow, while Lindsay took the other half and aimed for the port bow. As the pilots charged at Kaga, every ship in range unleashed a volcanic barrage of anti-aircraft fire. Ensign McPherson was with Lindsay's portside group. We shifted into right echelon as we started down, and I was on the end of the line, the cracker position. We expected fighter attack as we started in, and we got it, along with devastating AA fire. Winking tongues of flame were aimed our way from all directions as we did our turning power glide into position for our runs, for every ship in range was shooting fast. We seemed to be riding in on waves of tracer fire. The water ahead and below and around us was being beaten into foam by shell fragments from bursting AA. It gives you a funny feeling to know that all those guns are aimed at you. You wonder how close their fire will be, and you think every moment will be your last. As the torpedo planes charged ahead, the Japanese fighter protection descended upon them. The torpedo planes began going down in flames. Radioman Douglas Cossett was 23 years old. He was in the rear seat of one of the torpedo bombers accompanying the starboard side group. Using his plane's rear-facing 30 caliber machine gun, Cossett tried to keep the swarms of Japanese fighters at bay. Cossett remembered, From then on, things started to happen very fast. Before we ever got to the destroyer screen, the Zeros got on us. We had five of them on us. They had us in a scissors. Two on the right rear, two on the left rear, and one right down the slot. When I would swing my guns on one group, the other group would make a run. I remember us flying over a destroyer and the flak popping all around us, but I was too busy with the fighters to see when we crossed over the cruiser screen. I remember seeing Ensign Brock, our wingman, pull up to try to get a shot at Zero with his nose gun. Then, a TBD off on our starboard side blew up. It must have taken a direct hit on its torpedo. I kept thinking, I wish Walt would hurry up and drop the fish so the damn fighters would leave us alone. What I didn't know was that he'd already dropped it, but the fighters were still trying to knock us down. After what seemed like an eternity, Walt was able to get us clear of the action and the remaining fighters left us. However, there wasn't another friendly plane in sight. I had been hit by 20 millimeter shell fragments, which exploded inside my cockpit. All of it. 18 pieces, was in my legs, arm, and wrist. I was sure that I had been mortally wounded. Of 14 planes, only five got close enough to drop their torpedoes, and all five torpedoes missed. Ensign McPherson was one of the lucky ones who managed to drop his torpedo. As he beat his hasty retreat, he observed the next phase of the battle, 48 U.S. dive bombers began their attack, destroying three Japanese carriers in the space of a few minutes. In that moment, it appeared as if the American torpedo attack had yielded at least one positive result, distracting the Japanese fighters and anti-aircraft gunners so that the Navy's dive bombers could deliver the knockout blow. McPherson remembered, As we were leaving, the dive bombers were just attacking, and they were doing a marvelous job. They didn't have to contend with the Jap fighters that were down low after us, nor did they get as much AA fire because the gunners didn't have time to readjust their sights and swing the barrels into position for vertical shooting. We saw their bombs start towering fires, explosions were tearing up the flight decks and sending up huge spouts of water all around the three carriers. Great billows of smoke and flame were flowing and folding over each other as they mounted into the sky behind us. Of 28 crewmen, Torpedo 6 had lost 18 men killed in action, and two missing at sea. Meanwhile, the other torpedo bomber squadrons counted up their own egregious losses. When all the numbers were tallied, 100 sailors had flown on the morning mission, and 84 had been killed. After the battle, as he sat inside his empty ready room in USS Enterprise, Ensign McPherson experienced conflicting emotions. 
On one hand, he was happy to celebrate an incredible victory, the first decisive triumph by U.S. forces in the Pacific. But on the other hand, he was deeply saddened by the battle's cost. Eighteen close friends had paid the ultimate price for that victory. This is what McPherson wrote in his war journal that evening. June 4th. The Japanese fleet is crushed. What a terrific price we have paid. Out of my own squadron, 14 of us took off for the attack. Only four got back. One of these airplanes was so badly shot up that it is a wonder that it held together to land aboard the carrier. Tonight, everything is too confused. We are all hurt too badly by the losses of dear friends and comrades, whom we have known and flown beside for years, to be able to decide just how it all happened. It was a day of victory for our forces, but a tragic one because of the losses of personal friends. The Battle of Midway involved sacrifice. No one can doubt that the sailors of Torpedo Squadrons 3, 6, and 8 paid that sacrifice in full.